every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it is available on our website uh, for you to watch at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows for all types of libraries, um, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, archives, blah, blah, blah. Uh, really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, uh, something cool that libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Uh, we do um, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, book reviews, interviews, all sorts of things. Uh, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on the show to do uh, presentations about services and programs we have through the commission, but we also bring in guest speakers as we have this morning. Uh, with us today is Charles Fisher. Good morning, Charles. Hello. Hello, and he is from UNO, University of Nebraska at Omaha. <laughs> um, and he is talk gonna talk to us about gaming, about gaming. Um, Hints, tips, and cheat codes. For those of you who are into gaming, you, you get that. Um, <laughs> um, and running a game jam. Uh, this is a session that you did at NLA, ARSL, mm -hmm. I think right now. Yep, <laughs> it was at uh, NLA in uh, October, yeah. Just last month, yeah. Yep. Um, and I invite him to come on and spread the word to more um, people. So I'm um, very excited. I did, watch, I did attend the session at NLA. NLA, our Nebraska Library Association conference was a, a combo in person and virtual this year. Some of the sessions online, some of the sessions in person. And um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, Charles, to take it away and tell us all about how to run these awesome game jams in our libraries. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. So um, folks that have seen it before, um, I've got it like three different versions of this, but um, on this next slide, feel free to download and check out this presentation as I'm going through it. Uh, snap the QR code with your phone, or if you go to the tiny URL, htcc-gamejam, it'll link you directly to the current presentation I'm on. Um, I like to make sure to share the live versions of my presentation slide decks because I do a lot of editing because I am a poor speller, and there's a lot of editing that needs to happen after the fact. So download it. Um, Feel free to use anything from it. There's a whole lot of slides I on this that I won't be going through today that I encourage people to kind of like check out after the fact and ask questions about, including a lot of really cool pictures of a lot of games that are game parts that we've made here in the makerspace here uh, at in the creative production lab. Yeah. Cool. So the big question I want to do for folks um, that are watching or will be doing with this live is why games in libraries? I know I tend to be a little bit of an evangelist in terms of g making games, game design, game theory as an educational like framer, both for computer science education, library education, and art education. But I've been landing in libraries. I want to see why libraries are primo spaces to really make games or make game programming. So. One of which is that if you're already invested in makerspaces or not, if you've got the capacity as a library to really develop a community based around game development as a whole. So what game dev offers communities is this real inroad to technologies and subject areas research, no matter what it might be. And I say this um, maybe a lot, I don't know a lot, I say it here a few times, is that there's either a game on a subject that already exists and it could be better, or a game that needs to be made about a specific subject, and in inviting people into your space to make those games, one, you could build your collection, and two, really kind of get people into this interactive, very human thing that we do called playing games. So look, if you want to get into game design, game development in your space, look at what you've already got that's wonderful about it. You've got books, clearly, but you've got computers, basic office craft supplies, maybe stacks of paper that need to go away, big tables that multiple people can sit around and play with stuff, software that patrons otherwise would never have access to on their own without significant investment. But most importantly, you've got people there to guide folks through any subject that they want to get into, including game design. Well, if you've got a makerspace or trying to uh, get a makerspace into your library, you might even have stuff like laser cutters or 3D printers. And 
people that are invested in the space or work in the space that can guide folks through the additional technology implications of making games or game design as, as a bigger media practice. So what's cool about asset creation inside of libraries is that you can offer people, even if they're already making games, really cool computers that can run the types of stuff such as video game development engines that are really resource intensive and what's cool about the, that software is that it's free now, uh, whereas even 10 years ago, you, you were buying into a game development engine, but you can download Unity, Unreal, or Stencil to any of your computers for folks to get in on game design on their own ahead of a game jam programming event you may be interested in running. And if you've got a makerspace, you can really bang out prototypes quickly for folks. Of if you've ever had an uncle, I'm usually that uncle that is tr that has this idea for a board game. How can they get it to a production level where other people can play it and either determine that it's kind of goofy and maybe not worth market space, or really is worth market investment? And your makerspace or equipment or even craft equipment you might have can really take some ideas to a next level like that. And now, if you for the um, video game development engines and the computers for that, yeah, would somebody need a gaming computer, like a high level type computer? Because many public libraries, um, they have old computers. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, they haven't been able to update due to you know, budgets and whatnot in a long time, five, ten years. Um, so what kind of do you need a special computer to run those um, kind of things? No, no, not, not really. Some of the software, yes, like 3D modeling and some of the lighting stuff that you do in Unreal. But if folks are just getting into game design or game programming as a whole, Unity has this intro level and it's really kind of nice on 2D structures. Stencil is a really cool one What you can kind of get like elementary school kids through. And Stencil or Game Acre Engine and a couple other free ones that are out there run on anything that's kind of has electricity strapped to it. Um, it's gotten really good where in, five years ago, if you're making game in Unreal, unless you were uh, hooked up to a, a, a PC that glowed blue constantly, you're not going to do much. But now we're to the point where a lot of the intro units in Unity or Stencil um, can run on anything, including I think Stencil is slowly working on an Android only like snap together game structure. And it, it's, it's kind of some cool options where you don't need a whole lot of major tech investment to make game programming a way to activate even some older computers that you might have um, just kind of laying around. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So next up. So the big idea in getting that is knowing that you don't need a whole lot of mega computers. You don't necessarily need high-end software. We've got a list on our website of free software you may get access to, but game jams a programming thing, an event proper that you can use to say, hey, let's showcase what our patrons can do. Let's get people into the library and make stuff. But what are they? I, I've kind of got to the point where I just say, oh, let's do a game jam and just kind of assume people know, but most, most folks don't. So the I, pr basic premise uh, is that you give your participants a surprise theme, whatever that might be, uh, the color blue, uh, spring, and a very strict deadline in which to make a game of any kind. And at the end of it, they've got to showcase it so other people can play it or maybe even add it to your collection. Um, it's based on the idea of iterative prototyping or iterative development that some folks may never do, but the, everybody kind of does in some way or another. But it's a really cool way to, very quickly to get people excited about making a thing. And that time period basis and a theme really turns it into an idea of hacking things or where a hackathon is you've got to if for programmers you've got to code something very very quickly but that time stream basis and knowing at the end you've got a showcase really gets people into making stuff and there's a history behind this, this isn't just something i've kind of made up we've got global game jam which i'll showcase later ludum dare if you want to look that up online there's always a ludum dare going on indie jam and nordic jam where you get independent developers and in some tapes entire state or country governments around getting people into technology by making something small, accessible, and interactive. Um, and IGDA, the International Game Developer Association, has been very supportive of this.
So our jams here that we do, uh, before the pandemic, we they were entirely in-person events. We were doing 48 hours. We just loaded people down with Pisa and Red Bull and said, make a game. And it worked out pretty well. Um, during the pandemic, changed things up a lot. And I think it was a really good reflection of what we can do where we moved the events entirely online to Itch.io and Discord. And I'll go to that in a little bit, but gave people more time of saying, hey, we'd like to give you an, make an idea around the rights of spring and let's make a game. And people kind of ate their own pizza. Pizza is a big thing for us on a lot of these games and food as a whole. But post pandemic, whenever we get there and what we're kind of facing right now is mixing both an in person and online of everybody can get to our events wherever they come from, including our most recent spoopy jam. Our two award winners uh, were from, I think, Denmark and South Korea. Uh, so we get a lot of access from literally anybody and making little prizes for folks. So that forcing us to kind of mix or come in and make a board game here in the CPL or just meet us online has turned out really, really cool. So it's our showcase, oh yeah. And then because of that being offering the online version, did you notice or was it just different groups, different groups? <laughs> Yeah, so a couple things ended up happening, especially in the first one after doing some some feedback, is when we made it entirely online, uh, folks that we, you can kind of see from these pictures uh, are general game developers' identities are typically white men. Um, but folks online, when there isn't a group of white dudes sitting around computers kind of yakking at each other very loud, mind you, a bunch of white dudes are loud when they make games, is women and people of color that identified as such on our surveys actually showed up more for our online portions. Um, the freedom that you don't have to be in a space that may be intimidating or inaccessible has been great. Um, and I'm, I hate to say, I'm, I'm glad the pandemic forced us to reevaluate our accessibility structures using online and adding a bit of anonymity to the developers in order to enable that kind of uh, accessibility for folks. Um, because as, mu as much as fu much fun the in-person is, I want people to just make games and be feel free to make games. Yeah. I find when I'm doing online gaming, I mean, I I, I love it because nobody knows who yeah. I am or what I am. Um, I do gaming in person with friends here in in Lincoln, but you know they're all people I know. It's just a group that we've always been together um, for years and years and years. <laughs> but online, yeah. I love it. Like, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's been great. So if, if the idea behind what I originally thought game jams are about kind of making a game development community that's been really fractured or non-existent in Omaha and Nebraska, well, if we can grow the community overall, but just for, for people anywhere, it, it it's a great way to deal with it. And that's why I say post-pandemic, we're never going back to just in-person events. Um, I don't think so. In the, in no. Overall, in the whole world, I don't think we are. It's just no. so much, so many more people being are now able to participate in all sorts of events they never could before. Um, and just because of like the, the comfort issue or just the, lo the, the, the logistics. I yeah. live in you know California, but this great event is in Nebraska. Well, it doesn't matter now. <laughs> yeah, or what, what we you know, find out is- It never really mattered, but nobody really was forced to jump into it. But now everyone's like, yeah, I'll zoom into anything. <laughs> yeah. And and what we'll get into in a couple of slides here is it's really easy to run an event like this online now because the, the infrastructure for people that really wanted to do this were like, fine, I'm just going to make a website that makes it happen. So Itch.io is just like game jams all day, every day. Um, so yeah, I'll get into it. Like the, the pregame time of thinking about what you want a game to do and knowing how you can make it online, I'll kind of rush to get there a little bit, is how long do you want an event to happen? Knowing that it can be online, you can make a month long event. Or if you really want just a small in-person event, maybe just do a two hour one or a four hour one, or like we did at NLA, a 40 minute game jam where we got games completed. Of thinking about knowing that you got that accessibility online is, what are you gonna make your scale of the event? Are you gonna focus on something? Like if you're a one hour, game jam, maybe you only do a board game, maybe you only do little miniature board games, or if it's a month long one, it's all online, inviting patrons to do video games. My suggestion though is uh, do, do, do everything. Let people make literally anything is what <laughs> I consistently say. Um, and if you do an, on, an online version, is it gonna be open to all? This is a question that came up with Global Game Jam is do, do you want people from other countries joining in 
And the answer to my is, yeah, make it open to everybody or a local only, especially if you're doing like a one hour one that's only open to people, which you really want to like maybe focus on a local author as your theme. You can make those decisions much earlier on uh, and have on there. And the age group question uh, before you get anything ready is um, if you really want to restrict it to teens only, depending on your programming, or I'll suggest open it up to everybody. Like a seven-year-old will come up with the absolute best mind-boggling ideas for a game ever, but not quite have those skills. So pairing the the ideas kid with a slightly seasoned somebody who's made two or three board games turns into a wonderful community building partnership where that seven-year-old will continue to come to your events for the rest of the time that they are in your community and then be the older person that helps the younger person. So even if you want to do local focus, consider mixing it up a bit. Um, but the idea behind some of the last six years of us doing this is how you change up your events overall can change up how the whole thing functions. Like with Global Game Jam, this, this, somebody else sets a schedule. We just host the event. We use the website. It's been really good. Um, with Ostara, that was our first online event. The end, the end result of a really long lead time and early theme announcement was that way more artistic, weird, silly art games came about it insert game here where it's about making a team first and then they get the theme with a much shorter time window it means we get more experienced folks in video games that don't look great but function really well happen and with spoopy jam that just happened uh it's giving folks the idea to the the, the ability to pitch their idea early on by le deleting a theme earlier and then gathering a team before any actual development starts means that the games feel more complete and robust. So this is an option of like, when you're thinking about your schedule for the event, it can pretty much change rather drastically what kind of games you get made. Um, as an example, for 2019, Spoopy Jam has kind of stayed consistent where in our in-person one, we drop the theme People are given an entire day or even an evening to just come up with an idea before making anything. And the idea that what is non-competitive, we handed out prizes, but the prizes were like best use of spider legs because uh, it was Halloween themed. So nobody could really make something that used spider legs, quote unquote, successfully, but they could make them with spider legs and spider legs turned into it. That was a really creepy game, but it was delightful. Um, it has the, the idea that it, it, how you give your overview structure and letting people know ahead of time gives them a better plan on what they can do. So, but the bare minimum that you need for running one of these events is kind of thinking of an aesthetic um, and your theme. So that's that to, that separate those out into two things is Spoopy Jam is kind of a, has a Halloween aesthetic, but we'll get into later the theme, the special thing that people are making games on is a little bit more focused or goofy or just, uh, it, it's about sparking ideas, right? If you want to run a jam, don't just think we're having Game Jam or our library's name Game Jam is think of how you can really make it into a core event on its own if it had to move in some way. Do you want to celebrate a specific season holiday IP author of let's, let's say I, I would I would love to do this Game Jam because this was like my summer in seventh grade was how do you do a game about the life of life and writing of Willa Cather? Um, we, that, that was a summer camp I went to in middle school. It was great, but I could, I would love to see it as a game jam. Um, very Nebraska, uh -huh. but if you, you, yeah, you know, your patrons well, and you know, they like a specific thing as we got a bunch of, um, Minecraft folks. We got a bunch of, uh, uh, I'm just pulling kids games out of it. Um, Fortnite folks. And how do you key maybe making board games around some of the things that they like to do in their video games or, you have a lot of like you notice that your young like your uh, young patron fantasy books just fly off the shelf. Maybe make a dragon based video or, or game event. So that's the bare minimum is just pick a time, pick an aesthetic, generally what you like, and then really key in on what your folks love and you'll get a game jam. People will make games. So some examples of that is when we went with Ostara, where we've kind of got this really whimsical spring green theme growth thing. But our icons we picked, and this is where you'll notice in some of these, is we've kind of landed on these core icons that we use for our outreach, where Ostara is about this, like, the white rabbit, the electric rabbit, and on this, welcome to 1999, we're doing Matrix stuff now, but really picking and sticking with, because it allows you internally to make your graphics and outreach more focused, 
But as long as you land on something, just pick something weird and go with it. Um, and then, yeah, because then it also bled over into our theme where we found Stravinsky's Rites of Spring and then kind of put some uh, little sprites into it where that got us some really cool ideas. And that was our first time we got a European developer tag in on one of our local events. Um, or our 21, 21 theme where we're kind of using the general aesthetic to feed into the theme that we give to people. And that theme turned into making stuff about like after, you know, like destroying something in the game and then feeding it to regrow. Um, especially during the, the pandemic, this was a, a nice theme to people just think about it. Spark good conversation even if we didn't get a whole lot of games made for it. Where our summer game jam, insert game here, is a little bit more sci-fi-ish because we typically focus on video games where that sci-fi structure just let me kind of make these weird arcade cabinet things. And we get more video game focus of your aesthetic and your theme choices can result in getting different communities to come in and play where this is primarily college students come in and make video games in the summer. And that's what we wanted that one to be. And then we wanted to, in 2020, talk about alienation. We got games about aliens and people making games about how they felt very lonely during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and going back even further, where it's uh, if you want to really spark discussions as part of your Game GM event, getting a theme that really pushes, this is what we're talking about, the planet and what's cool about games and people suddenly find themselves making games about look the, the planet is literally falling apart what can we do to fix it how can we cooperatively build something new it's like hmm maybe that's something we need to do in real life too uh so it, it your theme can be, build a lot on that um spoopy jam started as we wanted to make a halloween one so we did and it looked kind of neat we tried to pair up a little bit of horror theme but it was kind of too spooky but then we went spookier sort of and it just went kind of goofy as long as it's extra goofy everybody got in on it but our names for this we've got names ready to go for spoopy jam for like the next nine years i think next year is um spoop oh this year was uh spoopy jam three spoopy jam four is um to heck and back very childish very kind of halloween but whatever it was good no halloween but not horror so. right yeah it's it's spoopy and if you want to get your urban dictionary out or just kind of like it's it's not scary it's it's like those dancing skeletons from the Disney uh, cartoon from 1923, where they're mm -hmm. just kind of like, ha, 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 they scare that cat. But in reality, they're just goofy. Um, but in this one, our themes are kind of latched onto that. It's, it's about bones or dice or skeletons or Johnny Bones Jones mm -hmm. of you letting your original theme idea kind of feed into other stuff or letting it get kind of weird, where in the flesh turned into some funky stuff. Um, but it, it kind of fed into... Where, we've, where we are now, where we've simplified our themes are down to like one or two words versus a complete sentence. Um, our outreach for the events uh, and running them is kind of unified, where we've got kind of like clean white, clean black with maybe a pop of a singular color we've chosen for a design. And then just kind of having a little bit of fun with the general imagery. Um, that's let me, knowing that I'm doing a lot of the organization on my own, is how simple can I make it so I can reuse something again and again and again for the design portion. Uh, so yeah, New Jams 21. Did I make this twice? No. So the, it goes back to the bare minimum event setup of this is just the very practical, what do you do step by step to make your game jam? Pick your dates. When are you going to announce your theme? How much development time are they going to get? And what is the absolute presentation deadline people are going to get on? Announcing these very early and making these hard and fast decisions for the time structures are the most important thing for rapid prototyping and development events at all, is I need to know what I'm doing. I need to know how long I get, and I need to know when I can stop. Um, but if you, you can change the feel of the jam of when you uh, uh, kind of announce your secret theme is do you do it this like art oh, we're having a game jam and it's about uh, nike sneakers I don't know, that might be a fun one and you announce it at the same time it becomes less of a rapid prototype and some of the games kind of feel a little bit overworked when you announce the theme at the same time as your event versus if you just do it it's like okay we announced a month out and then you only actually get to know what you're making for 48 hours this sense of panic and scramble is one, hilarious as a presenter, and two, people come together with some very great ideas when they're under that time crunch. So this is the rest of the, what do you absolutely have to pick a date? And 
if you can at all safely picking an in-person portion of this, um, especially for rapid prototyping, iterative development in games, people hearing other people come up with really absurd ideas from across the room, oftentimes what we'll see during that brainstorming session is teams will pull, up, pull themselves apart and go, hey, I know how to accomplish that in programming wise, or ooh, I really like your idea, can I help you make art for this? Is really cool kind of like moving structure of the in-person space that we have yet to figure out how to like, Discord does it somewhat, um, but when people meet other people in building that community in person and kind of like cling together like wreckage in a storm during the event, you really make this kind of really fun community of, yes, I'll come back knowing that Roosevelt's going to be there and he'll have a great idea for a, some kind of game and I just want to do his, his the 2D animation for him. But it kind of results in this type of big motion piece where everybody yeah kind of pulled tables together and drank a whole lot of energy drinks but everybody ends up doing this scramble in person to meet each other and bring their own stuff um that ends up being really easy to put together as long as you've got a room with tables and say we're making games folks show up folks have ideas and it just happens and the challenges thing. So if you go to some of our uh, web pages on our uh, game jams, we do these things called mutators, which are you ha you ideally should build your game around the theme. But what if you want to take an extra challenge to it? Like, hey, your game must be multiplayer, or your game only uses four-sided dice, uh, or it only uses if it's a video game assets that were free from Wikipedia. That was a fun challenge one year that resulted in really goofy stuff. And if you want people to do things like this, or do you want specific kind of games or topics being made, like the uh, Willa Cather stuff, is um, make a game based on the words on page 57 of My Antonia, and you will receive a copy of the book. Oh, people will do it just like, oh, cool, I get stuff for it. <laughs> you can get them to do it because otherwise, and I I, I keep doing these because I don't like some, some semblance of self, self preservation maybe three or four people at any event actually do the challenges. Or if they do, they become changed to such a degree that they were really good idea Kickstarters, but they really didn't hold themselves to the challenge long term. Um, so keeping them kind of nebulous and free floating as things people could do, it, it don't don't spend too much time on the challenges. Focus on making the space welcoming and having a good theme for people to get onto. And then if you really want to push people, yeah, it's a good idea as well. Because, yeah, no, that's what the idea is. Like, majority of folks don't even read this, especially once we're online, is I just want to know what my timeline is so I can get done and what's my theme. Most folks don't even read them. I, I love doing them, but most folks don't even touch them. Yeah. So here's some examples of those. Like, I spent a long time, and this is like one of five pages of these challenges we did for the for 2019 event, uh, where we included one of our sponsors, where Roast Coffee, um, uh, the idea uh, that the game and the board game the video game board game worked together it's it, it was cool ideas but they didn't end up like latching on as well but they did really good and people in, in conversation said i didn't hold myself to the challenge but i did start an idea from them so they're still useful just in my case don't make 20 challenges just make four or five um because then they can kind of like this one they're a little bit too long uh but the because uh, I want to say it out loud because the words are funny scooping the digital spoop challenger here is create your game on tabletop simulators like people because wait that's an option of making a board game on a video game uh, that that makes the game for you. Mm -hmm. So that turned into really pushing people towards adopting a new technology that they otherwise wouldn't have touched just by going oh okay uh, yeah, and that was really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to get into doing game jams yourself, so you don't have to come up with them on your own. Global Game Jam is an external nonprofit. You just have to host a local site. And right now, if you go to globalgamejam.org, they are taking um, submissions for local sites. So uh, especially in Nebraska, the only, there's only been one Global Game Jam site for the past seven years. It, it's us. But I would love to see more out west. Maybe Fremont picks one up. If we go out to Broken Bow, maybe we get some in York where your local community will see and they will give you all the support possible as part of the Plains Mountain region of you'll get maybe got a community college or uh, if a Columbus College it would be getting some students there. 
they, they give you everything you need to go. The, you know, the intro video, the theme, and it used to be just a 48 hour situation. It's still 48 hours, but now they've changed it to eight full days of however much dev you want to do. Um, I'm looking at the website. It looks like it's going to be um, January 20th through the 30th at 2020. Yeah, yeah. and their cool. suggestion is pick two days in there, but we're not going to penalize you in any way if you decide to do all 10 days. And that's what we did last year is it's a lot of work on our side to kind of like watch the Discord and talk with people and answer questions for all 10 days. But it was really helpful. I mean, last year was, and I think I could put this on the left side. Yeah, I our our theme our visual aesthetic for our local space is we decided to go with like a neon laser stuff but no surprise it, it works um but in 2021 was humongous where it continues to grow as an event if the uh game of gdc um in la has an entire panel dedicated to it and a space dedicated to making the games um and locally this even though it was entirely online it was the now after spoopy jam 3 the second best attended event we had ever had and 13 but i think we had three board games and 10 full video games made for it because people heard or game developers that happen to be on reddit or otherwise just go oh global game jam's happening how can i do it locally and they'll latch on um it's been really good to have that visibility from a large external space and the limited internal work other than making a phone call to your regional rep, which is here, you might just get me um, helping you do the event. So there's a much more robust uh, structure. And this is this is where it kind of goes into Global Game Jam is really, really on the ball as a 501c3 for doing surveys, identifying developers and saying once we went online, this is our first point in time where we go, wow we're really getting a key uptick in identifying as non-male developers which has been a huge challenge in the game development community is once you feel safe and feel accessed and can feel visualized in here people will hop on and global game jam is a great way to get in on game jams as a whole in a really robust event so our local ones are examples of this is where i'm saying we've got the opportunity to make your game jam online or your community development very easily with itch.io as a website or itch.io they've gotten into they have a dedicated game jam panel where you don't have to make your own website you just need to like we went with our bare basics pick a date make a description and maybe make some rules and you can even vote on prize winners on here and you, your website's ready to go and people from anywhere can sign up on it what's even cooler is that once you make a game jam site on itch.io it gets promoted by itch.io and um indie game developers will share it on their twitter if you're kind of friends with them and that's how i get a lot of traction and the second part of that in not having an in-person community or even having an in-person community that might want to talk after hours is discord just uh, setting up a discord server is free relatively simple if you've got set ones you may need to look at some ways to kind of quote unquote police it a little bit but not necessarily especially in game development community of people want to talk about what they're doing and seek help or make a team or just show off what they've got is between these two the infrastructure is readily available within five minutes and you can make a game jam ready to go our end result of that are after the game jam is done all of the games that get made be they video games or like a pdf of rules that people upload uh like the the insert game here 3d6 rpg challenge that was posted up in uh, the summer is you don't have to host the games anymore is people can download them from a link in perpetuity so long as the um developer keeps their page up which is open and it defaults to a creative Commons zero license so all the stuff is free and this is a really good way to help your patrons build up either a portfolio or for you to just put a link on your website to your game jam event and people can download the games without you having to do a bunch of additional html coding just to get your website up it's just just put a link with a button on hey look at the games our, our patrons have made and it's ready to go some takeaways after doing this uh for a long time is that idea that I kind of talked about is that unique identity of your jam, be it Global Game Jam as the Global Game Jam, um, is huge on making sure your promotion goes over well, especially getting outside developers to come in. Um, 
the really pushing the idea of that you don't need to know how to make a game. In fact, some of the best games that have ever been made or ideas that have been turned into games have come from folks with no experience whatsoever. And it's not about a competition. Ludum Dare feels like a competition. You get professional indie developers. But if you're here and just say, hey, grandpa, grandma, kids show up and we are going to make a game um, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, you don't need to know how to make one. The games that get made are these really cool, very human experiences, and you built a new team, and they'll keep coming back. Uh, is most folks aren't really there to make a game. They're there to, one, eat donuts and pizza most of the time. Um, or two, is they just want to meet other people. It's like, I didn't know that I thought I was the only person interested in competitive Catan and changing the rules in uh, Warhammer games. Well, you meet two other people that gets that, and all of a sudden, then you, in, in my case, you 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 follow your S class uh, after you graduate from college from people you met on making games, and now you're a little bit of a tiny company doing side work for folks. It's a really you meeting other people, not just from a business standpoint or an interest standpoint, but it's everybody's together around making something. And once you're done and kind of said like wreckage in the storm, you've been through a four hour thing. You've pulled out your hair, you've torn sheets of paper in half because your ideas were dumb or just not workable. And at the end of it, you stay in touch with those folks on Twitter for the next seven to eight years, uh, making jokes about how bad that most recent AAA game is. <laughs> so this one, I, I push on folks of why, if you can do in person, Newcomers will show up for donuts and stay for the board games and stay to help other people test video games. If you've got snacks at all, it is a phenomenal way to get folks that otherwise would not have even ever considered being part of it to be like, well, I know I, I know about um, a medieval history. I could help you build that game about horse combat. Um, and while they're come chomping on um, uh, donuts is, is wonderful. Ooh, we got the printer going on in the back. So the weird thing that has kind of cropped up is that if you're on a campus, so college universities, this is a really funny thing that can keep happening is the least represented of our developers that are on here are the students that are active at school. Even here at UNO, we've got two um, game design tracks to computer science and art. Those students don't necessarily show up for our events until after they graduate. Uh, it, it, it's kind of unique to us where the, they're like sub concentrations, not a full game design major where uh, maybe Bellevue University had a few years ago where don't necessarily key and hope, oh, we need college students uh, to make this a success. In fact, college students will, tri will trickle in and then they will trickle back in down the road. Um, but even if you're interested in making, hey, we want a STEM focus or a STEAM focus, including art and that STEM structure, making sure you support board game development is super helpful for everybody that gets in there uh, on the basis that if you if you can make it into a board game, you can make it into a video game. Like you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. But when you have board games, a lot of times what you'll see is folks that don't have coding experience or tech experience or even kind of computer averse will kind of step away from their uh, grandiose ideas of making this next complex video game and make a very, very good board game that you can keep as part of your collection and make and hand out to people and go, oh, I like this experience. The other thing is whiteboards. Get, get them as many whiteboards as you can humanly acquire. Go to Lowe's. They have a whiteboard wainscoting. Cut those down into 12-inch uh, by 15-inch little micro panels that you can put on your lap. Whiteboards make the make the event uh, even more so than donuts. So people can be hungry, but if they got a whiteboard, they'll be hungry and still come up with seven ideas and then erase all of them. Um, from year to year, this is the, the the big challenge mode of if you decide to go into it, your first year will probably have five people show up. It will be you, somebody who is hardcore into making games. But once you actually make games of you build it, they will come of if you've got folks inside of your library that are into board games, having them make board games and showcase that, hey, we made this in our makerspace. We made this with our cricket craft unit that we have over here. We made it on our computers that are just available. Everyone goes, wait, so you did this here. Can I do it too? That next year and the years afterwards of having that consistent time frame of, yes, every April we are doing this game jam or 
every every last Saturday we're doing our board game gym is that consistency is what gets people there and showcasing that you built something is what brings people in uh, and builds the community time and time again. Oh yeah, uh, if you're on this one was where I, I pulled it from when I made this for originally an on university one is if you can partner with anybody, partner with them. Uh, if you find a club or organization in town, or maybe you've got a hobby group, or you have a Hastings book place, finding those local people to get in and tag on as addition both helps out with outreach, and two, sometimes you end up with free stuff. Handing out stuff is great for in-person, or even if it's a come by and pick up your goodie bag. We have dice um, from the uh, local card game place, um, or maybe just pick them up on your own. But Game and hobby shop sponsorships are neat, but rare to come by. Most of the time, you're going to be buying it yourself, but tagging their name onto it is great to put up a poster in there. Um, vendor sponsors, here's your guide. Reach out to Red Bull, whatever your regional organizer is, or if you're on a campus, your Red Bull Wings team, and they will give you a, a case of Red Bull for your event, especially if you're doing like a two-day lock-in event. That Red Bull is great. Um, oh, yeah, I crossed that off because... Sometimes they just don't show up. I was very upset about that this year. So I crossed it off the list, even though I kept on it. So find somebody local and get coffee. But don't, but cross, Red Bull's really good, except when they're not. <laughs> and there are lots of local um, companies yeah. that definitely can work with, especially um, here in Lincoln right now. We have a new coming soon um, Mana Games. It's going to be a board gaming uh, uh, location. They yeah. start out in one of our. Uh, brewery <laughs> um, but now they have their own and i'm sure they would love to be involved in these kind of things but yeah look for your, your local stores there's places where games are being played and you might not realize it like this is being done at uh, cosmic eye brewing you wouldn't have thought oh this bar brewery is a place to find gamers who could yeah it is <laughs> yeah well and and look at spielbound here in omaha spielbound has made they've got a board game library they've got drinks um on an open bar and it's every saturday you're on a wait list to get in there if you had told me as a kid in 2002 i'd be on a wait list for a board game cafe i one i would have probably lost my gourd um but I, I think i would have been even more of a nerd than i already am it's just like this is where it's at it's super popular there's a lot of stuff popping up. And if you get a new, because what ends up happening, especially in, in small towns, because I know it's happened in, in Fremont, was you'll get a hobby shop that will pop up. Maybe they only last six months to a year because it's really hard with the, with the margins in a hobby shop. But if they're early, help promote them and kind of feed back into each other and really work on that. Again, community development through the, through the events. The fun part is if you want to be a satellite site for our, our game jams, I've already got a year of Game Jam stuff ready to go. I've got seven years of Game Jam stuff ready to go. I've got the Itch.io site. I've got a board game kit. Contact me directly, and I would be more than happy to hand over resources or show up at your library to help proctor the event, especially for a short-term one of having somebody, and I, I'm utterly shameless during these events, of walking to people's tables and yelling at them, no, cut that out you need to finish the game stop adding stuff and get it done or the hour by hour reminders of have you thought about what your player's objective is uh, have you written it down is it playable by somebody else or talking to two different tables and saying you need to go test theirs you should st steal somebody and, and help test each other's games of that type of like uh, i'd say authoritarian oversight especially to younger game jam events is i've become an acquired skill of uh and if you've got a teacher i'll tell you, partner up with an elementary school teacher if, they, if they're if they're if they've taught fourth grade they know how to do all of this very very successfully um and just identifying those things so i, I would love to come and help folks out and say look we're running spoopy jam four to uh, spoop uh, to heck and back as i think that title on that one and we're doing satellite sites in shadron and again i'm just gonna go back to fremont because i've been talking with them a little bit um uh, and they're running an event locally, so those games get posted up to a collective 20, 30 page game site, and every library associated it links back to this huge games collection. That looks real good for future grant applications, I'm just saying. So if you want that makerspace structure down the road, it's like, look, we hosted events that got 50 games made. Sweet, it's because we did it all together, and I'm happy to help out. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
I think there's something that some people are asking, wondering about is, you know, how do I even get started? With this? I know I know nothing about building a game, creating a game, but I'd love to host one of these events. How do I, as the library person, a complete newbie to this whole thing, even get started? Let me see if I got a slide on that. Oh, you do this. Uh, <laughs> this, this is where it gets kind of funny. Is I've got some slides for that. Uh, is you don't play games more than anything else. Just play a few games and break them down. This little uh, maybe you can see my mouse. No, you can't see my mouse. Uh, is on the bottom right hand corner. There's a box. Jesse Shell. J E S S E S C H E L L or L. The Art of Game Design is a textbook you know, that I use for course coursework as a whole, uh, and they make a deck of cards that ask questions that you can just kind of go through the deck of cards of, does your game address the player's um, uh, goal? What are the obstacles? What is the time frame? And you can kind of go through this whole deck of cards, and while you're playing a game, either one you've made or somebody else's, and just ask questions of it, it really kind of uncovers some of the core mechanics of game design as a whole. Um, so if you have no experience, what I put on this here for is gather yourself a bunch of junk, broken board games, little pieces of scraps, washers, as many dice, and I said it as a joke at the makerspace that I've now turned into an in-class assignment of make, excuse me, make Candyland from memory. Everybody thinks they know what Candyland is or has an idea. It's a game about moving from one end of this rainbow road to the other in some way. Mm -hmm. If you can make that and then make it better and then compare it to the actual rules of uh, Candyland or all the different versions of Candyland, that teaches you quite literally everything on a base level about a game that you may need to know of the player's goal is to get from start to end. How, what is the mechanic of doing so? Is it through rolling dice? Is it through drawing a deck of cards? Is it through spinning a weird spinner thing? Um, what are the balance? How long should that road be? How many players can play successfully? Are there ways that you can make new key features to make it more fun? So by making it from memory as fast as possible, comparing it to the original, and then making a better version is a fun internal experience of you can make a game, anybody can make a game, and then go, okay, if I can do it about this, can I make a game about gardening? Can I make shoots and ladders and involve hot pepper plants and cucumbers in some way? Of if you've if you have no experience whatsoever, give yourself an hour and make Candyland, and it is a phenomenal in class experience for watching students go. What way? I but I don't know. I've never played it. Somebody in the room has, and somebody can make it into a version that's kind of fun. Or I haven't since I was a child, and let's see if I can remember what I did. Yeah. I in my head, what it looks like. I couldn't tell you how I played it, but I love to make it up. <laughs> yeah. And, and it turns into this really cool thing because we it turns into the fun conversation inside of a room of the candy land you played as a kid. Did you move using cards or the spinner? Did you move in the 2000s version with two dice that had colors on them? The differentiation in how the different people's specific memories of candy land, one, date them pretty easily. And two, uh, it's it's this oddball. It's like, man, I, you, do am I really going to make Candyland? You do it to a college student. Oh, yeah. The answer is, yeah, you're going to make Candyland, and it's going to force you to be a better designer in thinking about every part of a game very quickly. Um, but otherwise, I think the, there's I've got a book list that I can tag. I'll, I'll add my additional book list from that course I'm, I'm teaching in the spring for everybody here. But The Art of Game Design by Jesse Shell is a must read. Um, and gets you and the the deck of cards kind of helps out. Um, plus, if you go to my YouTube, um, I think I got a link to it on here. I run one of these game jams live for folks to kind of walk through and see how it gets done. But most of the time, here's what's wonderful about the operating aspect of this is you don't need to know anything. If you really just want to have middle schoolers come in and give them a big old sack of dice and some whiteboard uh, and a bunch of scrap paper, and a time limit, as long as you remind them, hey, we only have an hour left, they'll make really cool games without a whole lot of guidance. It is a delightful experience to know nothing and watch folks just go wild because you gave them the space and the materials to do so. 
So that's another reason I, I really encourage folks to consider this as a programming at the library, because you don't have to have a whole lot of experience or buy-in. You just need to let people know, hey, next two hours, we're gonna make a game. And then when you're done, we're gonna play it. We're all gonna have fun together. It works out really well. But yeah, this is that deck of cards I was talking about. Oh, those foam dice are from the dollar store. But it gives you ideas of what will surprise players when they play my game is at the lens of surprise. This is one of the coolest things and you can get it for, if you contact the publisher, um, uh, Shell Games and you're an educational institution, either they'll give you a discount or they'll send you like a fat stack of them for free, which is how I turned, uh, got them, uh, I think like 10 boxes of these. It's been really great. Um, the other things that kind of lets it be is I've just shipped some samples of our presentations and promos of the games that have gotten made, showcasing your uh, game chunks and kind of goes into, well, we keep a lot of these hex things and glass pieces and broken board games on hand. Of It's a really cool opportunity of if you've got games in your collection that people have never checked out, don't check out, and you want to tear them apart for a display or for use as a kit to build other games, do it. It's a great way to recycle things. Um, you can also take a peek at some of our insert game here, the website that we have built out and our global game jam site and look at some of our games that we've made um, as examples of what you can kind of expect after you've been running stuff for five to six years, uh, including, I think we've got a game, it's a bottom right hand corner about a baby swinging from a, uh, a high rise building to steal people's candy as they walk below the building. That one was a really delightful game. And when that kid grows up and realizes that we used a sprite of him as a baby, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> Another thing that I kind of push on folks is the idea of make an arcade machine. We've had one. I've got all of the um, outlines ready to go for it. You can probably build it out of an older computer you have. And you can get people to make video games just for the arcade machine as well. Uh, this one, I'll, I'll leave folks, please contact me. I'll teach you how to make an arcade machine on the cheap uh, with, uh, here's all the planes for it. I've had to get it up and running. I'll, I'll just send them to you. They're great, it's fun. Um, because we can get student made games that'll show up. This has been a really cool showcase that has resulted in when you build it, they will come of showcasing student made games or patron made games in a place that is very vibrant, central to uh, a meeting space. Folks will say, hey, can I make one too? And they'll sit down at a computer and you can like, well, in the next two weeks, we'll kind of guide you through making a basic maybe space shooter game or a tag sort of a game, but they'll make it and they get a lot of programming experience and they do get to showcase it. It's been really fun. Or tying, if you've already got a board game event stuff going on is the great outreach if you're running a, hey, everybody come play our board games, but next week we'll be making them is partnering between those two pairings. One, you'll see more checkouts for your board games. And two, it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle of you've got you've got a collection and people want to add to it. If you tell them during your event that the game that they make gets added to the collection, they'll add it to their, to their entire collection. And they'll say, well, I, I want to make something great. Uh, I want to make it a box set. Let me, I think I've got it. Like this, this bad boy here was made during a game jam and then made on our laser that showcases 3D printing, our laser. And it's really fun and kind of like this gorgeous box set thing uh, just by telling someone, if you make it, we add it to our permanent collection. They're like, cool, I'm a published game maker now. It's a really cool feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, many and, libraries have, are getting into board game collections now. It's been a thing for years, but some are still getting into it. That's definitely something that's going to possibly, you know, branch off from that. Yeah. Uh, and I, because I had a conversation about someone with this yesterday of if you're looking for games to either turn into other board games or tear apart, put out on your social media of just saying, we'll take any board games you don't want. You will receive 20 or 30 different chess sets that are either collectibles or absolute garbage. Um, you can receive a pot, like a broken Paw Patrol game for toddlers, but the, par the parts are really cool of letting people know that you're all about board games you become this repository of you don't actually have to buy a whole lot of stuff and your collection can grow re relatively quickly. Um, yeah. And this is on that as well. If I'll add some more resources for people down the road of if you want to see how Global Game Chain came out in 2021, go to their website. They've got some really cool stuff, including right now they're doing the um, Global Heritage uh, Game Jam. Uh, some of the promo videos that I've made is on the YouTube playlist for our themes. If you want to look at the creative production lab as a whole and see what we've got going on check out our website there's a link on there 
Um, insert game here is all or where we used to be our repositories. Um, and at the bottom of this page, if you've downloaded the, the, the presentation is I've made a purchase list for some of the tech and for kind of a, how can we get stuff on the cheap software wise too, uh, as part of there. Uh, but yeah, plenty more links for everybody else, including please email me. I am more than happy to send people back seven pages, um, of, uh, pretty much answers to anything that you'll possibly want to. I love writing emails. I know that's an weird thing to say but i really love writing really long emails yeah and that's the end of that but here's the thing if you download this there's another 20 slides that you can check out on your own including weird samples of games that never got made the cut so feel free download this guy and that's that whole situation yeah uh great so um thank you so much charles anybody have any questions nobody typed anything in while you were um uh presenting that's okay um if anybody has any questions or comments or anything you want to say go ahead and type in the questions sub section um someone did see i see uh george here to say and i did notice this myself too i knew about this um happy international games week yes uh, coincidentally I, I don't know if this is uh, this, we didn't do this on purpose i don't think <laughs> um we got really lucky yeah uh, we're, I, 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 we're, we're bob ross in this everything's a happy accident and we're happy with it and he picked this one and it is um international games week is uh november 7th through 13th this week um, where you, you know it's a uh, just all about gaming for educational recreational social uh, ala has a website about it and information about different games and things and how you can you know, it's exactly what you've just been talking about today so perfect timing for that <laughs> yeah um, so if you have any questions, type in. Um, I am going to, um, let's see, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen while we're just wrapping up. If anybody has okay. any questions, go ahead and type. We're not coming off anything right now. I'm just letting you know. Um, so here is, yeah, I was talking about the International Games Week uh, page from ALA. Um, the slides which i will have a link to the slides also will be on in the when we um, put up the recording um and this is what um what john was just talking about this is the end of his presentation but all these other slides here that you can go look at <laughs> with more info <laughs> um oh and you're just saying for international games week um this is when you, you sign up and let them know what you're doing uh, he says there are currently 499 libraries that have registered um, so if you're doing an event or want to do an event for International Games Week, um, get on the website there and sign up. Um, ALA has a games and gaming roundtable uh, that um, has did a lot of work with library battle maps for Pokemon Go. Awesome. Yeah. And then the Global Game Jam website here. Uh, if you want to do one, there's a link right there. Get involved. They're looking for sites, as you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to see 2022 be the largest global game jam ever. And it's what's wonderful is every year has been the largest global game jam ever. It's getting bigger and bigger each yeah. time. <laughs> oh, this is what you're talking about, the Cultural Heritage Game Jam. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that yeah, that's happening right now, and they're in uh, Global Game Jam has partnered with uh, the federal government on getting some grants uh, out for that, and mm -hmm. their general presentation on it ha has been great. Um, the folks running it are really pushing the idea of let's let's talk about cultural heritage as a whole, either in the U.S. or beyond, and how can we make games about subjects. I kind of put that in that early slide of either there's a game about it that exists that could be better or needs to be played or there's a game that needs to be made about certain subjects. Um, and your game jams, depending on how you kind of make your theming um, uh, and your outreach for them, can address some very, very cool things um, very quickly too. Yeah, and as you said about games, that there's, you can find a, a, a game about anything really. And um, some of them are just for fun, some are, do have that deep meaning, you know, climate change, whatever, anything's going on in the world, uh, loneliness, social issues. Um, there's something out there and there's something you might want to create. Like you said, using Candyland and making a new version of it. Same yep. thing with any other game that's out there. Use something that's out there and how would you have liked to play it? 
how would you like you know think it could be run better or did you have some crazy idea when you were playing like i wish i could have gone here or done this go ahead and make it up <laughs> yeah they, there's nothing stopping you and okay. especially when it comes to board games there's very little stopping you. The vast majority of the parts of a game jam or a, a board game are just pieces of paper, scraps of paper. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got some recycled paper they can grab, tear up into chunks, and make your own game. Yeah, and you were talking about having, um, asking for donations, you know, saying, hey, do you have any board games and things? I'm sure all of us, we or our parents, have the old versions of the games we played as the kids where half the pieces have gone missing because yep. that's what kids do. <laughs> that's what uh, this this uh, broken version of Risk that is sitting back on my desk. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like, cool, It's it, the half the cards aren't there to actually play it. The pieces got chewed on by a kid, but the pieces that are still there are these little army men of different colors, perfect mm -hmm. for our game jam kit. And that's what's going to happen with this is separate out the junk, put all the pieces back in together, and somebody's going to make something out of this um, in at the end of January. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So it doesn't look like anybody has any other questions or anything. Um, eh, George, just just say uh, for the um, International Games Week, he's already planning for next year. <laughs> he's in uh, Indiana, so he's already looking at next year's because this is happening right now. But you can still make it possible. All right. So it is a little after eleven o'clock, so I think. Um, if anybody just nobody does have any questions or anything for Charles, we can um, officially wrap it up uh, today. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Charles, for showing up, um, yeah. sharing all this with us. I'm hoping you'll get a lot of people reaching out to you to wanting to do these kind of events in their libraries, um, and we get a lot more cool games coming out there. I'm a big gamer yeah. myself. My husband, we we do that. Um, I wore my D and D logo shirt today on purpose. <laughs> Tron. Just to, it's know, hard time. So, um, yeah. I'm hoping more people get involved in it as well. Um, as I said, we are recording the show right now, and it will be on our website. Here's our Encompass Live site. If you uh, use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, it's the only thing called that on the internet right now, so nobody else can use that name. Uh, we have our upcoming shows here, but uh, our archives are right here. Today, she'll be at the top of the page. Uh, should be. Um, I'm going to have it done by the end of the day today. Usually I say the end of the day tomorrow, but for me as a state employee, I'm, uh, tomorrow's a holiday for Veterans Day. So by the end of the day today, you'll have the recording will be up. I'll email everyone who registered today and um, attended today. So, you know, what's available. There'll be a link to the recording on the YouTube channel, a link to the slides. All will be there. Um, and we will push it out onto our various social media too. We have our uh, mailing lists. Uh, Encompass Live also has a, we have a Facebook page. If you do like to use Facebook, you can give us a like over there. We uh, promote about our um, sessions. Here's a reminder to log in today. We promote about our presenters that we have, our speakers on the show, uh, when our recordings are available for everything. So if you'd like to use Facebook, go ahead and give us a like over there. Um, we also use the uh, hashtag EncompLive, a little abbreviation there, on our Instagram and Twitter. So if you just want to look there for um, what we're doing, you can you know, look for that hashtag and see what's going on in the show. Um, you know, or just you know, keep an eye on the website. Um, here, while we're on our archives, I will show you there is a search feature here. You can search our show archives if you want to see what um, other shows we've done. Um, you can do the full archives or just most recent 12 months. That is because this is the full archives of Encompass Live going back to when we first uh, premiered the show, which was in January 2009. We've been doing this for over 10 years. <laughs> um, but we have all of our shows here, and this is something we do, librarians. We archive things sometimes for historical purposes, and as long as we have a place to host them right now on our YouTube, we will have these up here. Uh, but just do pay attention when you are watching a recording to the original broadcast date. Um, some of the information in these shows will be still be accurate and useful and something you can use, but some things may become old and outdated, um, incorrect information now because things have changed so drastically, services and products might not exist anymore, links might be broken, um, but just pay attention to that date so you know, oh, this is a really old one, maybe I should find something more recent if that's what I'm looking for. So that is all about today's show and our archives. Um, next week, we will be talking about uh, next year, <laughs> Summer Reading Program 2022. Is ocean, the topic, uh, the theme is Oceans of Possibilities. 
Uh, Sally Snyder, our coordinator of Children's and uh, Young Adult Services here at the Commission, will be doing her regular annual uh, list of books that you could use um, potential titles for your summer reading program for next year. So please do sign up for that and any other upcoming shows we have here. Um, I've got December dates, January dates. I've got more that will be filling in here on these dates that aren't open. We're here every Wednesday um, morning. So um, sign up for any of our future shows. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Charles. It was great to see you this morning. Yeah, it's wonderful to be on with you. Yeah, I hope you have um, tons of people calling you and emailing you. And you can send lots and lots of long emails to everybody. Yes. Trying to send you all. <laughs> uh, and all right. So thank you, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Okay.